Hey guys, welcome to the Hustle Podcast and today I have Anne Tham, who is the founder of the Ace Adventure Group, right? And she is this amazing educator, very inspiring person uh, and a lot of my friends and some of my, my team members as well were actually brought up by Miss Anne over here. So say hello Anne. Hello everybody. Okay, so um, I know that you have a very inspiring story because my girlfriend, my staff and all that thinks that you're an amazing teacher. You've always been, you know, very, very different. You take the, the, the path least taken when it comes to education. Can you explain a little bit more about, you know, your journey, how, you, how you've discovered your uh, passion in education, why you've decided to make a living out of it and stuff like that? Okay, first off, I have to tell you, I never wanted to teach. Okay. Yes, that was like when I was in um, university and back when I was in school. But the minute I started teaching, I loved it. I absolutely loved it and there was no turning back from there. Uh, one of the things I felt as, uh, you know, it, it's become my, my purpose in life, yeah, and the cause that I've taken on. Um, it's because the education system just wasn't making any sense at all. Not to me as a teacher and because I connected very well with my students. The more I hear from them, and I spend a lot of time listening to the things that they were going through, mm -hmm. the more it didn't make sense. Like um, the misery of being in school. Not, uh, not being able to wait to get out of school. I'm like, why? I mean, there's, you're, you're spending 11 years of your life in a place where you don't want to be in. That's not making sense at all. And then, um, worst of it all is that after 11 years, we are able to bring students through a system and not be good at something, in many things. Um, how do you learn a language for 11 years and be bad at it? That just didn't make sense to me at all. And uh, because I was the head of English at uh, one of the colleges in Subang, mm -hmm. I was doing placement tests. And the more I was doing it, the more I was like scratching my head as to about 60% are completely struggling with the language, okay? Then you have maybe another 20% who speak English, but they, the level was not that of a native, say, native speaker. speaker right. How do you learn a language for 11 years and not speak like a native speaker? But we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not just English, BM. I went through 11 years of Basa Malaysia and I was terrible at it. You know, and then I see a lot of uh, kids going through three languages and they can be bad at it. You know, not really mastering any one of the three. There are those who are very good at two, there are those that are also very good, but then they're the real minority. Right. Yeah. So what kind of approach did you, did you take in the beginning? Like how did you get started? Because you know, you know that there was a problem with the traditional education system. So what kind of changes or, or what, what have you done to you know, fix this? Okay, um, that actually was a lot of experimentation here yeah, because um, I knew that I had to get my students to do more interesting things. So I was cracking my head how to make it fun, right? Even in college, you know, I was taking a song, a very powerful song, and there we were making them draw as they were listening to it, you know, so that was, and then they loved it. And the, what got out of it uh, came up, came through very well. Then I created all sorts of activities. The more I did, the more uh, my students really enjoyed the class. So when I, uh, my, my children were growing up and I was like, huh. Your, your own children, this one? My okay. own children. They were about seven and nine at that time. And I was like, uh, do I really want them not to have these skills? So what's going to happen, you know? Um, and I was talking to a friend about it. My friend said, and why don't you get started and I'll send my son. I was like, hmm. And this was when you were still uh, working in a college? Yes. Okay. Yeah. By the way, so I came out and, uh, but uh, one of the, the reasons why I came out to do my thing was because um, there was this, you know, sometimes you never know where you're going to get the best advice from. I was at this um, hairdressing place just near my house, just in USG 9. Right. And this lady told me, she said, and um, you, you know, I was talking to her about doing an English class, right? So he said, you know, 
actually when you run a business, you don't have to have a whole big pie. All you need is a small slice. So I was like, yeah, actually small slice I could do. You know, like you're wearing this, the, all these big players there. So what can you offer that's different, right? Um, so I said, yeah, actually 50 students, I think I can do with 50 students that will work for me. That's 20,000 students in Subang. 50 should be all right, right? That was how it started. I Just see. Focusing on that small slice of the pie. Right, and you started off with a tuition center? In, yes. In, it, in Taipan, right? Yes. And it was in my house actually. It was in your house first. Yeah. And then you went and ran your own place. Yeah, because oh, um, the one thing I think uh, would help uh, people who are thinking of starting their own thing is that because um, a lot of people look at what their goal is, what they want to create, and they look for resources to work towards that. There's this whole idea called effectuation, and it resonated with me because how I started was I looked at the resources I had first. So, okay, I could teach. I felt I knew what was wrong with, uh, you know, what was missing or what was not done. Um, people were not engaging the young, the, the young people. Uh, I didn't have much money, so I said, okay, I have my house. I can't rent a place, so I, I said, I can use my house. Uh, I could spare 4,000 ringgit. I spent that buying books. That was what I did. And, um, and just got it started based on the resource. Oh, and this was how many years ago? Sorry. This was 1995. No money wow. for marketing, right? So but I had my two daughters and my maid, and we went and put in flyers around the neighborhood, you know? So that was what we did. So how many students did you start off with? In, um, in Subang, I, I started with, I think, uh, I think I had 11 students in my house. Okay. And this was yeah. after you quit your job? No. Oh. Um, okay, that's the other thing because um, it's something that I need to speak up about because a lot of people think that, okay, they're serious about the business so they should let go of everything and um, you know, focus. But when you do that, the minute your funds run out, you can't sustain. Okay? So, um, especially if you do have limited funds, right? Uh, what happened for me was I had the security of having a steady job and what I didn't know, now that I know years later, there's something called baseline. If you have a baseline and your basic necessities are taken care of, then it allows you to explore. And take more risks. Yes, or to even venture out like this, you know. Um, and that's, I mean, I... I should speak up more about this actually, yeah. And thank you for speaking out, speaking up about this here because like this is the thing that I really want to share with my audience. Mm. Um, however, I, would, I just want to pick on one point that you mentioned. You think that, you know, having a baseline, having a salary helped you explore, is it? It, it gave you more um, hunger or room to take more risks, correct? Um, I guess the the decision I made, I didn't feel it was a risk, because first off, um, the four thousand was what I could afford to. If it didn't work, I can afford to lose the four thousand. It wasn't going to um, drastically yeah, change your life like, or impact anything. Yes, make me lose my house, right? Um, and then the other one was um, so so I felt that the risk was managed. Right? right, and running it from my house was okay, um, so I didn't have to worry about the fact that I have to pay rent, and if I don't pay rent, I will, I'll have the, the stress was not there. Yeah, um, and that was why I made the decision. I see. Yes. So uh, just to put, give a little bit of my personal input, I'm a big proponent of burning all bridges. You know, mm -hmm. because I don't know, like for me, it's really tough to get motivated if I'm not chasing it. Which is why, you know, uh, what, how I started my business, I quit my job, I didn't ask for a recommendation letter, you know, um, I had, say, 20,000 ringgit in my bank account and I, I told myself that I need to make something work before this money runs out. Do you think there's a right or wrong when it comes to these kind of situations? No, actually both ways can work. 
Um, it's just that for some people who would uh, worry about making ends meet, then they may not even take the plunge at all. Right. So then, uh, a good, I'm a teacher, right? Teachers are like the complete opposite end of an entrepreneur. You know, security, I mean, is, is key, right? So for people like me, then uh, taking a step like this makes sense to me. Yeah, so um, it's something to share for people who may not uh, be worried about how to make ends meet. Yeah, uh, but yes, you are you are absolutely right. That there, there's another way where you can just jump right in and uh, go all out for it to make it work. Because uh, when we as we went along and we started the school was one. Uh, that one we I by then I had already moved out from having employment a, from employment. I was already running for. Uh, it was how many years back? I can't keep track. Uh, maybe ten years into having. Uh, been running the English classes um, so I was already out and when we did the school that required a lot of resources so when we did that we really literally jumped in and um, it's what we call die die must do die die must do uh, yes. there was no plan B for us you know we just knew that we just had to make it work so yeah Wow. So what kind of uh, resources does it take to create a school? I've never created a school before, so I want to, I want to know. <sighs> wow, that one. Uh, okay. There are certain um, parameters that you may have to follow, right? Uh, doing a school. So like uh, you need a space for four acres. I mean, like I'm a teacher, where do you find the finances to, you know, take on that? So we went back to basics. How did we do, you know, start the business with nothing, right? So we said, okay, you know what? I think I can kind of start and do it like a tuition center, right? And, uh, and that was how we did, you know, what we did. And uh, we were very clear that we must make sure we do not run foul of the policies of the education department and so on. So we were very particular. We took in only secondary students, you know. And it, that was where it started. Then a year plus later, we actually a year in, we realized that look, we have to be a school. And so by then we had like a year to prove that we knew what we were doing. Um, and uh, we started talking to uh, people who own property, factories, buildings. And we found two who said, okay, and we'll do this. And they were really, really kind. You know, because they waited a year. One of them waited a year to um, leaving that lot vacant just for you guys. Wow. For us to get our approvals through, you know, and then uh, the other one, uh, from the fact that we're a bunch of teachers, he took very little from us to get started, and he built this amazing building, Duyamas International School. Uh, he spent tens of millions to build the thing. Uh, and uh, that was just like, where do you find people like that? Also, you've got indirect financial backing from people who believed in what you, you guys yes. wanted to do. They found that education was a good thing. Do you guys, um, did, did you, you know, pitch them in any way? Like what, what kind of stuff, what kind of, how you, how you, you were going to, you know, revolutionize education or stuff like that? Well, the funny thing was no. Not, no? Not to the two of them. It was only later that they found out what we were doing. Like, uh, my landlords are very proud of us. They're really very proud of us, you know? Uh, but when I was talking to them, I didn't really pitch to them. It's just that they saw these three women, because three of my partners were the older ones, yeah, in the whole uh, group, our board of directors. And they saw these three women trying to do something so big, to take on a space this size, they were pretty, actually they were pretty intrigued for, uh, for quite a while. They said, talk to us a bit more, but they saw the passion of what we wanted to do. But not really the details because we weren't talking to educators or to uh, somebody investing in the business, so it never occurred to us to even pitch to them. Right, right. Yeah, we're just sharing that we wanted to do a school, you know? Hmm. Mm. So what, what's the drive, what's the mission for this school? Um, at first, we started off wanting to change education. Okay. That's how we started, right? And uh, as we went along, okay, we're changing education, but to what we didn't know. Like the, then, the end goal, uh, you know. And we right. realized nobody knew either. You know, what does the education for the future even look like, right? So, in fact, it was just like two years ago that I realized we were changing education for the future. 
with like taking it into the future. That was what we were changing into. And uh, then again, what it looked like, we weren't very sure. Like it was only like the past year that we had so much clarity as to um, what we were doing. Um, and it was like, we, we realized that entrepreneurship was key because it pulled together the skills from all the subjects, the knowledge from the subjects, and also skills that they were picking up from all the other things that we we're doing, like we're training our kids to be able to speak in public. They were collaborating and doing presentations in the physics class, and you know, they were doing dance and they were doing hip hop, of course, is our thing in our schools. Okay. Uh, drama and all that, it was all consolidated into the class when they were presenting, even if they're doing physics, right? But what uh, entrepreneurship did was allow the students then now to see whatever this, the skills that they have is marketable now. Not wait until they graduate and then find out, oh, oh I don't have these skills and uh, you know that the shortfalls to what people are looking for out in the market. So how do you guys determine like if their idea is marketable or not? It is marketable because they have to sell. Oh, do you do you guys provide a platform or like events and stuff like that? Yes, it are sometimes events, but more importantly is that because the entrepreneurship classes run every week for the next ten to eleven years, as long as they're with us, you know they 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 have entrepreneurship as a subject, right? But uh, we were already building the ability to um, speak, the, the, the collaborative ability, um, to know how to um, critically think, to be creative, all happening in all our classes. So what we did with entrepreneurship was allow all those skills to manifest itself into a business that they come up with. So we have students as young as seven years old running their started a business that's online and offline. Wow. Yes. We have another um, boy who started at nine years old and he started doing um, hydroponics and he's selling vegetables. Like yes. out of his home? or anything? Yeah, yeah, he's making it at his house. Um, I had another girl while well, she was in secondary school. In the space of one and a half years, she sold squishy, those uh, squishy stuff. Um, she sold 45,000 ringgit worth, yes, on Instagram. Wow. Yes. So, you know, that's what we need to know, whether the, the way you write is engaging. You know, do you know how to find what people are looking for to, you know, to give them value? Yeah, so like our, our um, the boy who's selling vegetables, he's actually solving an urban food crisis right now. You know, and he's turning 11 this year. Well, he started last year when he was 9, turning 10. Yeah. Do, do these students ever find, you know, difficulty juggling, you know, the, you know, the compulsory curriculum and also... Actually, this will make the compulsory curriculum make more sense because they're applying what they're, what they're learning, right? Because like the little girl who started the tea business, she's 10. She's running it for four years now. When you are able to speak to people then uh, and convince them that this is this is good, right? This uh, tea is, um, you know, this uh, floral herbal teas. She blended it herself with her mom and the grandma. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, um, wow. yeah, so she's already able to make uh, make a big decisions, eh? make, making decisions like how she wants the font, how she wants to market the thing. You know, that's actually using what they're learning in school to be able to verbalize. That's what English is for, right? To yeah. verbalize what she wants. And uh, she has to be able to count. Math, right? Math, yeah, to even decide packaging and how much to sell it for, you know. And then like when we make orders, we I'm her customer as well, right? So when we make orders, then how much to put together in order to produce the quantity, that's math right there. It's super interesting, you know, what, what the amount of impact that you have done to like the next generation. But I'm very curious because a lot of people have been telling me, you know, Jeremy, not everybody wants to start a business. Some people just want to, you know, have a full-time job, go maybe um, they, they just want to draw for fun and stuff like that. Like, do you see this happening among children? 
Do you think entrepreneurship is innate or is it something that is picked up? Um, for okay, for the most part, there are many skills. Like we, we have our forte, right? And then we gravitate towards a particular a skill set or and so on. Like if people like to dance, you know, they hear music, they start moving and they pick it up on their own. But we believe very strongly that a lot of things can be learned from nothing. So we, we have our hip hop students from not being able to dance to being able to dance well. Um, our students not doing a business to also understanding what it takes to run a business. Honestly, in today's world, you don't have a choice. You have to know because no industry is permanent right now. Things are going to switch, it's going to change. It, uh, there are industries that's going to get pulled out from under you. You know, like uh, the latest I heard is that in maybe another 10 years, the um, accounting as a career, only 5% of accounting jobs today is going to be done by humans. The rest is all going to be automated with AI coming in. So people who are taking on accounting as a degree right now. And deciding they want to pursue all in and be an accountant, for example. Yes. So they have to make sure they've got other skill sets because you don't know what's going to change, right? So honestly, as a person running a business, I would love it if my people come in with thinking like an entrepreneur, even if they choose not to be one. Yes, by all means, you don't have to choose to be one. But if you can think like one, your value in any company will be really high. You know, in fact, to the point where... Um, Intrapreneurs, yes. right? Intrapreneurs is one. Um, the other is just thinking like one, you know? And it can even be something like, I met an ex-student of mine, uh, he's working with one of those, uh, the, the more popular burglar companies, right? Okay, yeah. Uh, the, the one that's like cool burger joints that you get today. And he told me, he said, you know, my fr he loves working where he, he is, right? Because the company is really not just about burgers. They're very strong on social media and how to add value to people's lives and so on and so forth, right? So he loves it. And he told me, my friends are complaining about their jobs. And I told him, I said, you know, what you should be asking yourself what you're doing for the company. I was like, yes. Be because in order for you to have value, you have to be able to do something for the company, like grow it. Before you get value back. Yes, yes. So the minute he thinks like this, first and foremost, um, as he's already thinking like an entrepreneur. I need to hire your, more of your ex-students, I think. Sure. Fantastic, really. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, picking back on the AI, the automation thing that you've mentioned before, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, the when I was little, I always wanted to be a pilot because, you know, you know, you dress nicely, you look handsome, and you know, you get to fly with uh, hot girls, right? And my parents actually wanted me to go and do that. Yeah. But I'm so lucky I didn't because I just read some news on Seeking Alpha that Boeing, Airbus, these companies already have the tech to automate flight. It's just that the aviation board doesn't allow it because it's not tested and stuff like that. But I'm pretty sure that it's safer than a pilot piloting the plane. Okay, that would be debatable for the moment, yeah. But you're right, absolutely. Anything that can be automated because, um, yes, they can. you don't have to worry about human error for one. And uh, pilots being tired um, and uh, maybe making judgment calls because we, we, are, we don't have sensors around us to know what's coming at us or even what the temperature is like out there or what the weather is like. Yeah, we depend on already on um, machines, the computers to tell us that. So yeah, that that is very, very likely. It's mm. going to happen that way. Mm. I don't think it's likely. I think it's only a matter of when nowadays. Yes. So what are the traits in entrepreneurs that, you know, will reduce this risk from getting automated into, you know, redundancy? Adaptability. Adaptability. Critical is adaptability. And then the ability to um, be um, creative because um, people talk, talk about creativity but they have, and they're thinking more of the arts, right? You go Graphic into design. design and stuff like that. But you have to be creative to solve problems. You like it or not, you know? Um, to even come from an angle that nobody thinks about. So, um, 
for for the moment when industries get disrupted or jobs get disrupted, you're going to have to pull from that ability in order to figure out what to do next. Mm. Yeah. So let me recap: adaptability, um, creativity, creativity yes. as well as critical thinking and problem solving, essentially. Yeah. And one more is resilience. Resilience. Oh, it's amazing that you know you have to know how to, um, like, if, if something comes along your way and you just got to work it through, you know. Um, and actually, one more: people talk about failure. Asians are afraid of that word. You know, but you really, I think, as as an entrepreneur yourself, you know what it means by failure is you give this a go, it doesn't work. That's okay. We're not going to beat ourselves up about it and lie down there and say, okay, I'm going to die. Yeah, but to to okay, but what can we do next? And I tell you, this particular skill is completely undone in our current education system because the students are not allowed to make mistakes. They get punished for making mistakes. But what they don't understand is making mistakes and learning. Okay, uh, okay, so this doesn't work. So maybe I take a different route. That is actually a very a high order thinking skill, which is doing process of elimination, experimenting, failing, try something new, try something new, try yes. something new. Yes. And. Even solving the same problem, okay, I did this, okay, doesn't work. I, I I use it in games. You know, I play a number of online games. <laughs> like, uh, like, I'm so curious now. I'm hooked on Sum Sum. Sum Sum. And uh, yes, the Disney Sum Sums and um, and Garden Scapes is one because I can't garden. Garden Scapes is the one where you get to pick. I see so many of those ads like you get to pick like yes, oh there's a scenario. Your own garden. And then oh oh it's on fire and then you have to like. Cut something that one, oh, right? Oh no, no cutting or anything. It's just uh, the gameplay is very similar, you know. But uh, it's more that I get to build my own garden, right? It's very pretty, as I can't garden for nuts, by the way. <laughs> so, but the point is that every time when you when you play those games, you you okay, okay, I die very quickly, right? Um, and I said I realized, okay, I may need another five more steps. So how do I cut off five more steps? So okay, going this route, all the things are dropping here. So the next round, I'm going to focus more on this side. So but the side didn't work. I went this direction. It didn't work. Focusing on this portion of the game screen, I guess yeah. that's what you call it. Um, so this didn't work. So okay, it's dropping from here. So I focus on this. I said, oh, now I'm. I need maybe two more steps. Um, so what else can I do, right? But literally, I have to think like this. You know, so I, I find that um, playing games it really keeps you sharp. And I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> this is not what parents want to hear. That's for sure. Yes. Oh, I'm loving this. Um, mm. Yes, I actually I play a lot of games myself. Uh, mm. I like playing strategy games like Civilization. I like building ancient China up, competing with like you know England and stuff like that. Yes. Because it helps with critical thinking. I think I learn more about economics. And history from that game than any textbook that I've read. Thank you. That's the direction education needs to go. Wow. Gamified. Gamified. Yeah. So can you can you you know just elaborate a little bit on how you instill say these qualities, say uh, resilience, creativity amongst your students? Like what kind of exercises do they do? Um, actually, it's not that. It's just how we respond to the work that they do. Right, you want them to be resilient. It's not to beat them up or every mistake that they make, or the, if the work can be improved. Uh, we don't come from the space. Is why do you give me such a lousy piece of work? It's more like okay, I'm glad you brought this out already. You're able to do up to this point. Okay, this part here, I know your ability. Can you think of how you can do it better? You know, it's just it's just that. Yeah, I think if you ask so my ex students, it's more like coming from. Mm, a positive. Um, it's I coming call it positive. from. There's a term upgrading. You, upgrading. You upgrade. You don't do corrections. Upgrade instead of corrections. Yes, because corrections at the moment, the way uh, Asia does it, is quite dead. You know, like you uh, okay, you make a mistake. This then, is okay, wrong. This is wrong. This yeah. is wrong. And the teachers, uh, you know, go through it with you, and you just copy them, right? Um, or you copy from a friend. You do all the corrections, and the teacher is happy to. Tick 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 tick. Okay, corrections done. What we do is that if the student is um, has made a mistake with something, say, okay, okay, you know, we look at this um, because sometimes it's just careless. 
you know, or they just need to think a little bit harder, right? So we get them to okay, okay, look, read the question again and see whether you can figure out what has gone wrong with this, right? Or sometimes you point out this part here, there's something wrong here. Can you really look at it? They come back and the thing is done. You know, or when it comes to writing that I do with my students, when they come back to me, I say, look at the sentence now, it's so beautiful. See, that's all it took. And it wasn't that we thought for them, we didn't give them answers. It was that we just gave them the opportunity to think a little bit more. That was it. That was it. It was the solution is that simple. And does this whole belief drive the way you run your business? Yeah. Yeah, we do that. And it permeates through your entire organization, your other teachers and all yes. those kind of things as well. Because children and teenagers, they are very good at spotting if you don't walk the talk. You know, if you tell them all this, give them all this amazing advice. And then you make those mistakes. Or we don't follow that. And we don't practice it ourselves. They can tell in a minute. And that's when they stop listening to you. Hmm. So, um, very interesting. And I'm also curious, um, you know, you've been an educator for so long, right? You know, and there's a lot of talk about all the Gen X, the Gen Y, the Gen Z, how they're different, how, how Gen Zs are like this. Do you yeah. see this as a real prop, a real thing? Like, do you see that every generation is like different? As oh, well? yes. Oh, yes. I, I would recommend this book called um, Gen Z. Okay. okay, it's called Gen Z. Oh, I can't remember the name of the writer. Um, it's amazing because he actually, um, they're different because the parents grew up in different generations and you are impacted by the politics uh, around you at that time and the social, uh, social uh, economic issues at that, at that time. So it does, you like it or not, it does impact and you grow up in very different, um, you know, in very different homes, right? So. But the main thing is this, there is another generation that's already here and people don't know about it. The Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha, tell me more about that. Okay, uh, for a while it was very difficult to find articles about them. Um, somebody was sharing with me. Gen Alpha are kids who grew up, uh, who, were, who, are bo who were born um, 2010 and above. Okay. They're now in schools. Like standard one, standard two, Correct, right? right? But the education system doesn't suit them at all because they grew up with devices in their hands. They are able to um, navigate it at the age of one plus. And then from being able to um, engage with devices and interact with it, and suddenly you give them a book and say you got to learn from this book where everything, this. you can't interact with it at all. You know, so therein is, lies a huge gap between what these kids already know and ver versus the education system and what we're going to be doing to them. Mm. Yes. So what, what do you think is the next step for these, for these Gen Alpha? Because okay. my niece, I'm interested in knowing because my nieces, mm. they're both Gen Alpha. Three of them actually. Mm. All you have to do is check this. Look at what they know already from what they've learned online. Um, and look at their textbooks at standard one. Mm -hmm. If you look at the content of what they have to learn, already you know there's a, a gap because they know a whole lot more than the books. Okay, uh, kindergarten also. Actually, don't even talk about uh, primary standard one. Yeah. yeah, just kindergarten alone. They're still they still have to learn at the age of maybe four, five, and six about what a cat is, a dog is, but they know the names of dinosaurs. How do you square this, pull it together? Mm. They know the names of planets at the age of three and here we are talking about cats with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and forcing them to sit down and write it. So what, what alternatives do parents have if they're bringing up a Gen Alpha? You know, like just say, like my nieces at three years old, they are, they are YouTubing. You know, and they, they know so, their vocabulary is extremely wide. Exactly. They know about so many things. Exactly. Would it be, would it still be purposeful to send them to schools? Ah, schools have to change, that's for sure. Um, most parents will not make the decision not to send the kids to school because they still need that basic education. But uh, parents to support 
at home. Um, you see, the minute the kids start schooling, the parents will start going after them on the devices. Mm, yes. Like, oh, stop using this iPad so yes. much, right? Why are you not studying? Uh, why are you, you know? So that kind of thing is, and, and oh, um, too much play on the computer or the devices. You got to stop it. And why are you not revising your work and things like this? So that has to stop because um, you, you, you need to control the use. Okay, but um, actually parents can help the kids use the devices to learn from, you know. Oh, so you need to learn this? Okay, let's go find out from online what space or uh, what it is that you can get there that can help you understand this better, right? If they're learning something from science, let me go check out Bill Nye, the science guy, you know, uh, that's from Disney Channel yeah. and see what he says about it, you know. So they, they, they use the computer to learn with rather than from using it for so many years and suddenly the parents Stop. take them off it. And then you instead look at the textbook. Correct. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Mm. Okay, so uh, I think there's a lot of super valuable stuff in this episode already. I'm just going to ask a few more questions. Sure. Right, you, you mentioned that you started off with 11 students. Yes. 24 years ago, right? 24 years ago, how many students do you currently manage now? Um, my, the school alone is three, right? So we have 1,700 students there full time. Then uh, my English classes, we have about another 2,000 there. So you've got yeah. 3,700 students. Yes, and we just recently opened a kindergarten in Jakarta. Wow. Yes. Jakarta, do you have any other um, presence in any other countries outside of Malaysia? Uh, oh, that's because, um, you know, we were just talking about this. We have got a requ request from a number of countries. So we are working towards it. And Jakarta is our first foray into a foreign country. The other one that's happening is in uh, Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, so what kind of arrangement is that? Is it like for royalty, like taking over your syllabus or you setting up a school over there? Uh, currently it's uh, joint. We were uh, in partnership with our Indonesian and Hong Kong partners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Hong Kong company has already been set up. We did a pilot testing for the program that we're taking there, which is the entrepreneur program. Um, in Jakarta, we, we are supposed to, we, we are going to open a school, but my partner said, and can we do a kindergarten first? So we ended up with a kindergarten curriculum where we are collaborating with Finland. We have Finnish partners. <coughs> wow. Yes. Okay, so I, I, I wanted to ask you this question. What's next for you in the next five years? But it seems like it's, it's going to be about expanding yes. outside of Malaysia. Yes, and then a lot of the curriculum that we have, like the Power, the Powerpreneur, which is our entrepreneur program, that is getting a lot of interest from so many parties around the world. Um, and people want our school because of that program in there that wraps around our whole entire school schooling um, I guess methodology pedagog pedagogy and yeah I see culture yeah okay mm. so in the next five years I'm, I'm you, you're still actively running the business I, yes. right so in the next five years like do you have any have you set any targets for yourself or anything oh, like yeah. that actually <coughs> yeah me. like uh, in Jakarta our target is three international schools and 20 kindergartens by in five years. Wow. Because I've got amazing partners there. And the market is, is, uh, is huge. Ten Not, times the size of Malaysia. And they're hungry. They're hungry for something different. Why is that? Um, the education system, you know, in many Asian countries is too old, right? Um, and uh, for them, even the foreign education coming in is still very traditional. We're looking at parents who are in their 30s now and they wish there was something that was different from them when they were growing up. And they are looking and they know the world is changing. That's the main thing. Yeah, they know the world is changing. So they are the ones who want something different. Mm. Yeah. Um, last question. Do you think yeah. it's possible? Actually, second last question. Do you think it's possible to use the internet to teach your your type of uh, curriculum or syllabus? Okay, that's that's very very good. Um, people asked us 
very often as to um, to take our education online, and uh, we we are strong on the ground with our students building rapport, creating excitement for them. It's a very different ball game to actually speak through the camera like this. Um, like the engagement and stuff, right? Yes. So people have asked us to do it, but we didn't want to because that traditional way of teaching and somebody standing in front giving information is way past. It's been done to death, and it's boring for children. Children, they they need to engage. They need to work with with people, right? Or uh, maybe content they can learn, but then what you do with them uh, may be difficult on the online space. So that's why we ended up because um, our strength is gamifying a lot of stuff in our classroom, right? But we we gamified it to the point where we created the first chemistry role playing game in the world. Yeah. But that's just an embodiment, a physical embodiment that people, a visual one that people can see of what we're actually doing in the classes, right? Um, so we we are working towards that, uh, going on to uh, more on gamifying the education, not at the level of taking a textbook or a workbook, turning into a game, but it's still a workbook. Like literally, tell chemistry as a story. You don't even find a book in there. You know, the information is given through a story. So Kate, uh, I'm sorry. Like I, I just keep coming off with, with with more questions because it's so interesting. Like about the chemistry game, is it like a board game? Is it like a? It's an RPG, role playing game, <sighs> right? It's okay. an adventure game, right? Um, and now we're also doing board game, uh, board games because card games come under board games as well. We're creating yep. that. We we took our assets, the IP characters that we created. Um, and we turn them into a card game, right? Um, and a, a whole bunch of other things is coming out from there. But it's something that we felt needed to be done, right? Um, there's another thing that we're actually doing online, but it's starting. So I'll hold off sharing that. Uh, yep. But it's, it's just fine. about learning uh, in a way that young people want to learn. Yes. So right. fixing uh, problems for them, like a whole lot of content to remember. Who's helping them to remember stuff? So that's the the space that we're gonna challenge next. I see. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's about it for this episode. Thank you so much, and for coming on to the show and sharing all these juicy information with us. And uh, I really wish when I was growing up, you know, I would have been able to be at your school if I could turn back time. Um, that's all I need. You know, just for people even to feel like they would have liked it to have this when they were young, uh, that's that drives us. <sighs> yeah. But it's a regret to me, you know. But it's no, 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 don't regret. Just move forward and do your part to change, make that difference, and change the yeah. world. Okay. Uh, thanks once again for coming on to the show, and uh, so guys, if you're a parent of any, you know, if you have a child and you're in Malaysia and you want your kid to learn better than you know the industrial age education system that we have definitely check out Miss Anne's school you know Dwi Amas, Sri Amas uh, and if not the tuition you know the English classes you know I think you'll be able to benefit a lot from these classes okay and um, is there anything else you that you would like to add on and you know you want to you know do a bit of self promotion of any of your products. Oh wow, well, for us, it's, I think it will be more about adding value, yeah, to um, parents and educators <coughs> out there. Um, it's okay for your kids to learn and have fun and enjoy learning in the process. Because my biggest issue when I deal with a lot of parents and educators is they think that you can do one or the other and you can't do both. And that doesn't make sense to me because children and teenagers learn best when they enjoy what they're learning. That is what I would say. Okay, yeah. thank you so much once again. And yeah, if, guys, if you know, if you know anyone or, or if your loved one is a new parent, Please share this episode with them because I think this will really, really help them a lot. Okay? Bye.